All right. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to our uh, geophysics and tectonics seminar. I'm um, excited to announce that our speaker this week is Dr. Amir Solari, uh, who's a postdoc at the University of Michigan, um, who will be talking to us about uh, tsunamis, a topic we have not yet had in the GNT series. Um, so uh, I'm excited for this. Um, and so, Amir, whenever you're ready, please go ahead. All right. Um... Okay, uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, thanks, uh, Kelly, for, uh, uh, for the introduction. Uh, a big shout out to all of the organizers of this uh, uh, Geophysics and Tectonics Times uh, series. It's been a, uh, quite an interesting ride for all of us uh, with the variety of uh, different topics covered throughout the seminars. Uh, so for today's talk, I'm gonna uh, do a little bit of an experiment. I'm uh, putting together uh, a bunch of different topics, a bunch of different uh, case studies or phenomena that uh, hopefully we're going to learn some new stuff from. And these are from the quote unquote unexpected tsunamis. And by unexpected, I mean, these are stuff that either through the field work or when they happen or when uh, we were doing the modeling, we didn't really expect them this or the signal to be there. Uh, uh, so it's going to be uh, kind of a uh, crazy ride, um, just a a word of uh, fair warning. And uh, this is going to be uh, uh, the result of uh, some collaborations with colleagues at the University of Michigan and Northwestern University. Now, one of the downsides of doing the virtual uh, seminar is that I cannot really see people's faces. So I'm not sure if you're bored or you're falling asleep or anything. I'll try to squeeze in some uh, cartoons just to keep, uh, to keep you hooked. So uh, uh, yell at me or something if, uh, you, uh, if you need a break or uh, I, can, uh, I can manage. So uh, here is uh, what I'm thinking. I'm going to talk about uh, tsunamis, sort of a tsunamis 101, sort of a crash course of how we do tsunamis in this uh, business. And then I'm going to present uh, case studies about Cascadia, Gulf of Mexico, and Persian Gulf. These are interconnected, but not necessarily uh, in order. Um, then uh, hopefully by the end of this talk, um, you'll be, I mean, the answer to the question listed below is going to be yes. At any rate, so without further ado, uh, tsunamis. So how do we uh, study tsunamis? First thing first, it's going to be uh, the tsunami source. When we're thinking of tsunamis, we immediately think of earthquakes. We associate tsunamis usually with underwater, huge underwater earthquakes. We call them mega thrusts usually because they're so big and so energetic and uh, uh, there's all kinds of damage going on. Um, but it could be other stuff uh, as well. Uh, for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to stick with tsunami for, uh, with earthquakes for the uh, rest of this talk. So what we need for tsunamis uh, is the dislocation uh, source. The dislocation source is when we have uh, some sort of motion at the bottom of the ocean, usually along the fault uh, 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 along the fault plane. And in the world of seismology, uh, if you're familiar with this kind of notation, we love to model or show earthquakes with these, uh, with this kind of balloon shaped thing, which we call them a double couple or a focal mechanism of the earthquake. And for the uh, purpose of uh, this kind of earthquakes that usually occur in the subduction zone, they look like, you know, things like this. And it shows convergence at the plate boundary uh, where the locked, otherwise locked energy has, has been released. Uh, it's, these things are really nice to work with because double couples as we model them are really localized and uh, you can show the geometry of the faulting pretty easily with them. So if I have the size of the earthquake, I can calculate the ocean floor uh, and I call it the uh, ocean floor deformation. I call it the initial condition of the, uh, of the tsunami. I'm assuming, uh, and it's a sort of a leap of faith. I'm assuming that the deformation from this uh, ocean uh, bottom gets transferred to the surface of the ocean, almost what we call incompressibly, which means these two the, uh, sort of deformation fields of the surface of the ocean and the ocean floor just mirror each other. And again, this is called the initial condition of the uh, tsunami simulation, and it's exactly where I come in. So um, this is going to be, a, I've converted a tectonic problem into a hydrodynamic propagation problem. And if I run my tsunami simulations, I'll end up with something like this. And I put this ca little cartoon here uh, on the loop because I just want you to notice that the, as uh, you know, uh, the, the, the further away you move from the tsunami source, the smaller it becomes. The tsunami waves become smaller and smaller in the amplitude in, in, in the simple setup. 
uh, that I'm showing here for uh, the flat ocean. And then this is usually the result of two things. One is attenuation. Attenuation means it's basically friction. And it tells you that you know the, the water molecules and the, the friction between the water molecules and the bottom of the ocean uh, results in the a sort of a decay in the tsunami amplitude. And the other thing, the important message here is geometrical spreading. And it's basically uh, equivalent to saying that I have energy at, at a point and I'm releasing it and it's sort of expanding into a sort of a balloon. And as the balloon expands, you have smaller and smaller density of energy on the surface of the balloon because you have your energy source is finite. And this results in the, you know, in the case of the tsunami in the sort of, again, again decay uh, in lack of a better word of the amplitude of the uh, tsunami. Uh, but the nature is not well behaved all the time. And it means that, well, for example, for the case of Tohoku, while I have this sort of a beautiful, uh, well-mapped rupture, it's not a point source. It's actually elongated. It's like more than 400 kilometers long. And it's called a finite rupture model. And it sort of deviates from the point source, but you can, you can approximate it still, the, the general dominant mechanism of the finite rupture with this guy here on the left. But then again, it's more complex. And then you can use fancy algorithms to calculate, again, the surface deformation from this finite rupture models uh, to uh, calculate the surface deformation at the bottom of the ocean. And then eventually from those, you can calculate maximum tsunami amplitude, tsunami distributions, and uh, all kinds of things about attributes about tsunamis using uh, numerical models. So the source is becoming more complex, but the message is still the same. You can, as long as you have the initial condition, uh, be it complex or simple, you can actually calculate the tsunami propagation. No, so that was for the source. What about the propagation? Propagation of the tsunamis is most importantly dominated by, by the bathymetry. They're called gravity waves. Uh, and uh, for the sake of simplicity, for the rest of the stuff, I'm not going to show you the, how uh, you know, the, the math of this whole thing works. But there's one equation that I cannot avoid, and that's this very simple equation. And this is the sort of a, a result, a, a kind of a byproduct of um, what we call the shallow water approximation to the Navier-Stokes equation, which are the driving forces behind uh, the motion of tsunamis. And what it means, this is a really, really beautiful equation, uh, if you don't mind me saying, and it's, it tells me that the velocity of the tsunami is equal to the square root of gh. Uh, and h here is the ocean depth, g being the acceleration due to gravity. And you plug in numbers here, and it tells me that in open ocean, when you have a typical ocean with a depth of sort of average four kilometers, uh, the speed of a tsunami is about uh, 700 kilometers uh, an hour. And this is nice. Uh, it tells me that the equation, uh, the tsunamis travel oceans, cross oceans at the speed of a jet plane. But another uh, sort of a byproduct of all of this is that if the ocean sort of shallows, the tsunami has to sort of slow down as well. But the energy of the tsunami has to go somewhere. When you're slowing down your car, you're pushing on the brakes and you're producing heat. What about tsunamis? Well, it turns out there's a well-known phenomenon called shoaling, and it tells me that, uh, so here I have this coastal slope, and I have blown up the top bit of this here in the top figure, and the tsunami waves, as they approach the coastline, uh, they become bigger, and this is where the water molecules just accumulate on top of each other, and as you're moving away from the source, although geometrical spreading and uh, attenuation dictate that the, the tsunami waves have to become smaller, that coastal slope tells you that they also have to become bigger. And this is what poses danger to coastal communities because upon slowing down, they produce danger because they become bigger. And a familiar analogy in all of this, uh, I hope it will work, is called uh, traffic pileup, as we're all familiar with it. So you have just imagine an array of cars. The first car in an array uh, sort of slows down, pushes on the brake, and then the, the other cars, the rest of the cars are still moving fast. And then as they slow down, the relative uh, sort of distance between them increasingly becomes smaller and smaller and smaller until they just crash and you have a traffic pileup. So if, if in this little cartoon here, uh, on the top bit of this little cartoon, I'm showing the car density, um, uh, sort of a cool way to show this, uh, as uh, in, the, in, the, in unit length. So if I run this little movie here, you'll notice that the cars are getting accumulated and accumulated on the top, uh, you know, on the top of the row. So it's very, very similar to shoaling. You have something like a traffic, uh, something uh, called traffic pileup, which is very similar to the shoaling phenomenon. So end of sidebar here. I think that's enough uh, uh, for one day uh, tsunami background. So let's just move on to the first case studies, Cascadia. And this is actually quite interesting. This is a, a kind of a byproduct of a project that we, we did here 
uh, at U Michigan with uh, colleagues at Northwestern. And uh, we tried, as, as you know, there is a large number of rupture and tsunami scenarios for Cascadia. We don't really know much about the constraint of how a future rupture would play out. There is one data point, one well-constrained data point in 1700, even for, for a magnitude nine earthquake, which is uh, supposedly ruptured throughout all across this plate interface, or I mean, if, depending on whose paper you're reading. But then um, these are good, I mean, uh, all of these are, uh, uh, equally good because uh, we don't really have much constraint. We have just you know 50 years worth of you know genetic data. We have some little seismicity data, but it's not well constrained anyway. So there are a bunch of rupture models, and what would be interested? Okay, what is the you know worst case tsunami scenario? What is the tsunami scenarios that I have to be uh, prepared dealing with? And then well, we go ahead and calculate tsunami uh, propagation maps using you know things like this based on uh, the initial condition that they. You know, talked about before. So these uh, sort of slip deficiencies are rupture models uh, that we use to in our uh, tsunami simulations. But the funny part is that if you show the coastal tsunami amplitudes for, let's say, the you know magnitude nine point two uh, earthquakes, uh, magnitude upper you know lower nine earthquakes, what you get is interesting. You get a more or less uh, you know uniform tsunami uh, amplitudes along the coast, uh, but there's an exception. There's sort of a singularity to it that like. Uh, at the middle. And it's sort of uh, irrelevant uh, or independent of the rupture model. It's always there. And it's somewhere in the middle. Well, geometrical spreading and attenuation, remember, told uh, is telling me that if I consider the plate interface here, they're almost more or less at equal distances from, from the trench. And so you would expect more or less either a uniform amplitude distribution along the core, along this line, or it should be larger. Uh, near the large clusters of uh, uh, slip on the fault. But that's obviously not the case. Uh, so what can we learn from here? Just a quick, quick sort of a sidebar. Um, this is where, again, the linear sort of propagation pattern, geometrical spreading and attenuation fails. What else can we do? What can we use the geometry of the problem and geometry of the tsunami propagation here? Uh, a good example was the 2010 uh, Mentawi tsunami uh, in S South Pagai Island in Indonesia. So here is the big island, the main island in Indonesia, Sumatra. And this is the South Pagai Island I'm showing with a red star. And Immune to tsunami waves. But lo and behold, the large tsunami amplitudes were observed here uh, as uh, colleagues uh, back in 2010 did uh, field work, Hill et al. Um, and uh, you know, uh, they showed that you know, what you, you would expect otherwise uh, to be a safe place is actually not. It's going to be a focal point of tsunami energy. And why is that? Well, Let's do a little bit of experiment again. Uh, what you know, you can you can you can show approximate the coastline sort of a plane wave. You can you know, approximate it by this little box here. You have this island on the right, and then it's uh, in shallower bathymetry, obviously. So let's assume it's a continental shelf. You have deeper bathymetry here. Now I can put my energy source somewhere here. Just to think of this as a candle. I'm doing ray tracing of light beams all around, and then this island is sort of blocking. Uh, uh, the path of these rays. So immediately you see this area here that I'm showing with the green rectangle should be immune. Uh, it, it should be sheltered. The lee side of this island should be sheltered from tsunami waves. But if I use the hydrodynamic simulation here, this is the initial condition of my tsunami model for a really large rupture that I showed in a box. Uh, if I run this little movie here, I you'll notice that you have large tsunami amplitudes here because tsunamis are just sort of wrapping around this island. And then there is edge waves uh, of this, what we call the edge waves, which is equivalence of hydrodynamic equivalence of um, surface waves. Um, they produce a tsunami maximum here, just right behind this island. So what's assumed to, to be sheltered is actually the most hazardous segment. Now, enough of sidebar. Uh, let's just uh, go back to the question in Cascadia. So can this sort of a geometrical distributions, uh, this kind of, geometrical setup of the problem actually affects this, uh, um, this phenomena here. And so in order to look into this, we set up you know, the, the curvature problem like this. So this is the, the west coast of the US and Canada. Uh, 
this uh, the blue line here I'm trying to show, um, this is my best effort is reproducing the Cascadia subduction zone. And then, uh, so this sort of a green circle is the curvature, is sort of the ge geographic circle that I'm fitting Cascadia coastline to. And it has a radius of about a thousand kilometer. Um, curvature, I'm defining it as a one over radius. It's just a, a big number. Um, it's an interesting um, topic. Uh, if, you, if you're interested, we can chat about this after the, uh, after the presentation. But at any rate, so if I'm doing this synthetically, uh, again, to simplify things, on, on first order, I'm making a uh, fake bathymetry. So this is a flat ocean uh, by a very shallow continental shelf next to a coastline. And I can change the radius of curvature of the coastline from infinity, let's say, to a, um, uh, I'm sorry, from zero to a very sort of a large number. And as you can see here, the coastline is more, more and more curved. Now, what I can do at each step is that I can put, uh, you know, this sort of a source here that I'm showing with uh, a series of red rectangles, and I can uh, simulate the tsunami from this source. And, and so the map on the right here is uh, maximum tsunami amplitudes from this uh, various tsunami scenarios and this various uh, bathymetry. The vertical bars on the right are coastal, maximum coastal tsunami amplitudes. So you can immediately see that after, let's say, uh, a th certain threshold, uh, this uh, sort of central uh, latitude, let's, shall we say, is experiencing larger and larger and larger tsunami amplitudes uh, as I am decreasing the uh, curvature radius. So our study shows that curvature can increase coastal amplitudes by at least 10% through focusing of the energy of edge waves uh, on the continental shelf. And of course, uh, something similar to optics, uh, focusing the tsunami energy at the focal point of the curved coastline. So this was something interesting that we just uh, learned about the nonlinear features, something that you cannot really expect from simple you know, rupture models, just doing them uh, at time t equals zero, propagating it for some time and just looking at the results. You need to um, uh, do, take some nonlinear aspects of the propagation into account as well. Um, so uh, again, changing gears, I'm gonna talk about the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and mega thrust tsunamis in the back are basin. And this is a kind of a rather crazy idea. Uh, if you think it's blasphemy, just bear with me. I'll, I, I hope I'll uh, convince you um, that this could actually work. So the idea behind all of this, the motivation behind all of this was the, uh, the you know, this past June's uh, 20 uh, and 2020 uh, earthquake and tsunami in Oaxaca. Uh, there was a little uh, earthquake here by little, I mean, a magnitude 7.4. Uh, earthquake here uh, in the uh, in the Pacific in the near the Oaxaca region, and as a result of that, there was a tsunami. Uh, and this little movie shows the propagation of tsunami uh, uh, around. Uh, there was it was a small, mostly local, locally felt tsunami. It was picked up by the bunch of uh, tide gauges uh, along the coastline, and arguably uh, by single dark buoy in the Pacific because it was not really big. Uh, so there are all kinds of interesting features going on here in the fore arc in this little movie. But what about the back arc? I mean, if you look closely in the Gulf of Mexico, this is, I mean, to the tsunami, this is just the far side of the world. Why do you have some, uh, let's say, fluctuations here? There's this long period signal just sort of wandering around in the Gulf of Mexico. Now, this is, a, I mean, granted, this is a model. This is just the way I like to fantasize about the world. Uh, but does this work? Um, does the back arc tsunami, as I call it, uh, exist? Well, if, so this uh, here on the left, I'm showing a sort of a geographic map of, uh, sort of zoom geographic map of the area. Uh, the, the red star here is the epicenter of the earthquake. And then on a, uh, here, the quote unquote back arc, tectonic back arc, I have these dark, uh, these, uh, sorry, tight gauges. Uh, I'm showing them with black dots. And there's a single uh, dart station uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. For those not familiar with the term, dart stations are deep ocean pressure sensors that are used to show the propagation of tsunamis and are used uh, mostly for far field tsunami warning. Now, none of these things actually ever you know, recorded the signal. I mean, it was a real, I mean, if it was real, it was, it would be very, very small in the order of a few millimeters, well below the de detection threshold of all of this. But then there was this one station at Calcasieu, Louisiana, and the antipodal side of the rupture in the Gulf of Mexico that had recorded something and it wasn't recording anywhere else. 
Uh, here I'm showing the data in blue, and then as is customary in this kind of business, I'm showing the smooth uh, sort of version of this uh, time series in red. Now the green curve is the tsunami simulation. Uh, if I sort of from this uh, movie that I'm showing here on the right, I just record the maximum tsunami amplitude in, uh, uh, in Louisiana. And this is what I get. You see the amplitudes are not, the match between the amplitudes are not great, uh, but there is kind of a match in arrival time and the period of the signal. Now this is real, or again, is this the kind of a fantasy or all kinds of things actually can go into this to make a signal look like this, but it's definitely worth pursuing. Now has, again, a sidebar, um, has this thing ever been recorded? Again, is this just my fantasy about the world? Or is this real? Well, it turns out as the result of the 2011 Japan earthquake, there was all kinds of chaos going on in the four arc. Uh, we all remember Fukushima. Uh, we all remember uh, the 12 foot wall in Miyake would overrun easily by a tsunami. But then um, there was this weird signal uh, in the back arc. There's this paper by Mortani et al. in Pagia. They, published results uh, looking into tide gauges all around the, uh, the Sea of Japan. And they actually showed a co-seismic signal. They showed a signal whose timing uh, could not be explained by a tsunami signal just moving around the island at you know, four hours and then showing up on the, on the record. It was exactly co-seismic. And the signal was actually observed by the local fishermen who didn't really know what it was because they had never felt an earthquake. Everything, remember, crazy every, uh, everything when it was in the four. So, this can happen. The idea, as crazy as it sounds, it works. Now, uh, what are the contributing factors to all of this? How it, how we can go about explaining this? Well, this is all uh, at the mercy of this very simple model. I can assume at the bottom of the ocean, there's a buried inclined fault. It has a focal mechanism. Let's say it has, uh, there's some slip around it. And then from this, as I showed you before, I can calculate surface deformation at the bottom of the ocean. Now, the caveat is I can actually put a landmass in the center. And this landmass is going to create all kinds of problems because again, as I'm transferring this surface deformation to the ocean of the surface of the ocean as the initial condition of my tsunami simulations, you can see that I am dividing the universe to the eyes of the tsunami into co two completely separate domains. Uh, and this is going to uh, cause problems uh, through the eigen, um, eigen functions of, of oscillations. And so this is the four arc. In the back arc, it's this, this sort of displaced amount of water, which is isolated from the source and everything else. And this is uh, the sort of volume of water that's going to create a, um, a tsunami. Now, I'm claiming that this tsunami is going to be inherently different from what we see from the four arc, because just the, you know, my, my intuition tells me that I'm, by partitioning the universe into two chunks, I am create, creating a duality. So let's see how it works. Now here, uh, again, from the co-seismic deformation, I am uh, putting together a bunch of synthetic tests. These are flat oceans on the left that are separated from shallower, let's say, uh, semi-enclosed uh, enclosed gulfs uh, by this narrow spit of land. And in each of these cases, I am simulating uh, the or calculating the surface uh, ground deformation, the ocean floor deformation, using again that that kind of crazy equations with. Uh, uh, from the surface deformation, from, from the source to surface deformation. And in each of these scenarios, I'm changing different source parameters. And you can easily see that this deform the surface deformation is also leaking into the back arc, You're leaking into this uh, kind of a flat, um, simple gulf that I have here on the right. Now, in the four arc, this is a kind of a well-established fact that the eigenfrequency or the dominant frequency of the tsunami or dominant period of oscillations of the tsunami is uniquely determined by uh, the fault width. No matter where you put the fault, no matter how you sort of how bury, uh, how deep you bury it, how you change it around, how the slip works out on the fault plane, it's pretty much usually always the same. You get a very similar tsunami uh, period for that same fault because it has a, you know, a, a, a sort of a certain dimension. Uh, or certain width. But in, the, in this particular problem, it, it, it turns out that if I plot the dominant period from the tsunami simulations using the surface deformation, uh, I'm basically using my, again, uh, tsunami simulation codes to make this. And I calculate the tsunami, uh, dominant tsunami period. And for if I plot this against the dip angle, I see that it's actually not a horizontal line. It's a function of the dip angle. And here I'm showing the, you know, the, the fit to the data uh, or you know, the data from my simulations is the red curve. Um, 
Now, if you remember uh, the simple cartoon that I showed you before, uh, you see it's not, it's not actually that crazy because if I put a fault in here and I'm showing the fault here uh, with uh, a sort of a red wedge and the, the sort of surface, surface projection of this fault is going to be this sort of hatched surface. And this is going to be geometrically uh, depending on the fault depth. And what this tells you that that is inherently, I mean, there's no other way about it. I mean, the back arc um, uh, dominant period has to be a function of fault dip. And I can go ahead and predict sort of uh, using simple equation, predict the dominant period of the tsunami without any doing tsunami simulations uh, as a function of dip, just using those the, the dislocation models. And this is the green curve that I get. Now the green curve tells me that these, these two are both quadratic functions. Uh, they're not exactly the same because uh, the green one is not uh, calculated, so to speak, from the tsunami models. So it tells me that um, it's, non, it's not non-linear. But as a, as a matter of fact, if you show, if you look closely, they're both following the same or very, very similar trend. So this is actually something quite interesting. Now, uh, another important thing, so that was about the source, the kind of unexpected nonlinear nature of the source. But what about the propagation? So in other words, remember the slide that I showed you, the sort of a little map, and, and it said the only station recording a signal in the Gulf of Mexico as a result of that earthquake was Calcasieu, Louisiana here in the north. Why was that? <clears throat> well, if you recall Cascadia, uh, I talked about the curvature of the coastline. And then it turns out that I can fit a geographic circle to all of this. And again, Calcasieu, Louisiana is the exact uh, ideal location for getting uh, converged large tsunami amplitudes, mainly due to um, uh, converging, convergence of edge waves. Now, just um, this is just a little bit of extra thing I'm just squeezing in here. I'm going to also talk about the future hazard of Cascadia. Uh, of, I'm sorry, of Gulf of Mexico. Should be worried about all of these things at all. I mean, this is something that's showing up in, in, in my model. Could be, could it be dangerous? If you look at the uh, to answer this question, I am looking at the USGS and CMT catalogs for for, for the region, and uh, these this is the seismicity of the area. Then the map on the, on the left, and um, the stars here show the earthquakes with focal uh, with magnitudes larger than six for which we have reliable focal mechanisms in the CMT catalog. The cross section shows me things like this. Uh, it's a pretty steep slab, but at the same time, uh, the major large seismicity is shallow. It's above 25 km, almost about 25 km of depth, uh, which could be hazardous for the sake of tsunami. But one thing that's kind of interesting is that this there is this huge seismic gap. People call, the, call it the Ohaka seismic gap. It was a notoriously large event magnitude uh, of magnitude seven here uh, a couple of years ago. But again, there is this idea that this thing, uh, considering its dimension, it could produce an you know, upper magnitude eight probably. So uh, that's uh, the major kind of its concern for the sake of seismicity. But what about uh, tsunamis? In order to make the tsunami source, I'm uh, looking here at the seismicity map of the region. These are the CMT catalogs. Um, um, for the earthquakes, the, earthquake, the, the beach balls are color-coded uh, according um, to focal depth. So as you, you can see that this is a nice Benioff zone. I'm moving from the trench, the earthquakes are becoming deeper and nice. And the plot on the right is uh, the old idea by Cliff Frolic. He basically proposed this sort of a ternary diagram to um, sort of partition the focal geometry of the earthquakes into a three uh, different classes, normal, strike, slip, and thrust. You can use different, uh, you can use the mathematical equations to actually uh, set this up to find uh, the, the sort of a flavor that the, a given uh, region uh, uh, sort of favors for, for the earthquake. Now, if I get rid of the deeper earthquakes, uh, the shotgun blast that I showed you turns into something like this. And this tells me that I have more of a thrust more of thrust earthquakes. So this region is more prone to produce uh, thrust earthquakes uh, in the shallow region. You can show that uh, it's it, that the size can also reach uh, um, uh, you know, a considerable amount, but that's uh, for further uh, uh, debates. But at any rate, from, from these uh, thrust events, I can calculate a dominant mechanism using the minimum Kagan angle. And this is what I get. I'm just brute forcing 
uh, a larger dip to this mechanism because I want it to be, um, you know, have, have a higher dip. Remember, the, as the uh, fault plane becomes uh, you know, uh, steeper, it's producing larger tsunamis and you know, more high period tsunamis. So I'm just brute forcing a worst case scenario here. Now to make fake earthquakes, I take slab uh, one uh, slab two models, and the slab two model I just cut cut out sort of the shallower part of this uh, subduction. I fill it out with my beloved mechanism, if you wish. I, this is something that I calculated, as you saw from uh, you know from the CMT catalog, and this is what I get for each of these scenarios. I can go ahead and calculate a tsunami in the Gulf of Mexico using the same simple analogy uh, of the co-seismic deformation. And for each of these scenarios here in this little map on the right, I am showing uh, both the distribution of maximum tsunami amplitudes in the Gulf of Mexico and the coastal uh, maximum coastal tsunami amplitudes along the coast. Now, if I run this little movie here, you'll notice as I am moving the coast, uh, the earthquake closer and closer and closer to Oaxaca, uh, which is this green star, I'm producing large tsunami amplitudes in Calcasy, Louisiana, and Coatzacoalcos uh, here in Mexico, which tells me again the same thing. Uh, Calcasy, Louisiana is going to experience the largest tsunami amplitudes in uh, all of my cases of uh, predicted, again, quote unquote, tsunami uh, uh, earthquake, uh, fake earthquakes in the region. So the takeaway uh, message from this part is that backward tsunamis can be excited co seismically during mega thrust earthquakes. Of course, they, their, their size and dominant period of, uh, are determined by the dip angle of the fault plane. And Oaxaca earthquakes, uh, remember that's the, uh, the, where the seismic gap is, can create the highest backward tsunami hazard in the Gulf of Mexico. Now, uh, again, if you're not bored yet, I'll try to wake you up by, again, changing gears and talking about uh, Persian Gulf and the mega thrust tsunamis in the, uh, in, as, a, as a whole, mega thrust tsunamis in the Gulf uh, with narrow openings. Can tsunamis in, uh, from deeper oceans uh, leak through the Gulf through such narrow openings? Now, just a sort of a quick and dirty overview. This is the region uh, that I'm talking about, if you're not familiar with it. This is the Persian Gulf here that I'm showing with the pink arrow. And uh, this area is uh, called the Macron uh, subduction zone. It's, it's, it's called in general the Macron, but uh, here there is a trench that has notoriously created in 1945 a Tsunami, uh, eight earthy, and followed a tsunami that created significant casualties. Hello, I think I got disconnected. Yes, possible. Okay, so let me. Sorry, can you share so, screen again? Where, where did you lose me? Um. Mine was was freezing up. Uh, go back one slide. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, I have to change my provider service provider. <laughs> anyway, so here, so this is again the quick overview of the region. Uh, I'm showing Persian Gulf with the sort of a pink arrow. Macron subduction zone is this. Uh, I'm just uh, depicting it with this red rectangle. Uh, and this is a trench that notoriously created a tsunami in 1947 uh, from magnitude eight earthquake. It was, uh, it created devastation both near field, Iran and Pakistan, and Oman and the far field, India, and arguably the coast of Africa um, here. Now, if I zoom in uh, to this map, um, it's a kind of a tectonic mess really, because you have a triple junction further in the south and this, uh, the plate boundary map here is kind of a sketchy here, but then, uh, they're hypothesized to be three different ruptured blocks. And this is the old idea by Ando in the 70s. Uh, he basically said that if you have a sort of an elongated rupture, rupture it can uh, elongate a plate interface, it can rupture it via different or through different earthquakes. And I'm showing these uh, three, three different ruptures in A, B, and C. And they're all kinds of possible scenarios. Um, 
by diff different permutations of these three uh, rupture blocks than you can use uh, to, produ uh, to produce tsunamis. But if I simulate the tsunami here, understandably, you see why in the far field you have India and well, Amman here a little bit, but not much elsewhere. It's because of the, you know, the, the curse in seismology and tsunami business is called directivity. Rupture directivity tells you that the, the sort of the maximum amplitude lobe uh, from for the tsunami has to be at the you know perpendicular to the length of the, of the rupture, and the question is, can the tsunami actually leak uh, through uh, um, the Strait of Hormuz, as I showed here in this slide? Can can it leak through this opening into uh, the Persian Gulf in the absence of any other major? Um, mega thrust source in the region. In other words, does the energy get into the Persian Gulf? Now, remember, so these are my rupture blocks, and I'm just trying to figure out if the energy is able to pass through this narrow opening, which is like, you know, uh, 50, 60 kilometers wide, even if not less. Uh, if you take into account the bathymetry, it's actually becoming more dreadful because it's becoming very, very, very shallow in the Persian Gulf. It's basically like a bathtub. You have just uh, imagine a square shaped uh, sort of ocean, uh, which is only 30 kilometers or 40 kilometers, I'm, so, I'm sorry, 30 meters or 40 meters deep. And that's just barely enough for shipping, uh, for navigation, but that's it. And, and it's so shallow that the tsunami waves are likely to sort of die out if, if, if not just upon opening. But has there been pre uh, precedence to all of this? Because in modern time, we have just one data point, and that's the 1945 event, and that was not recorded in the Persian Gulf. Uh, well, <laughs> the first example is actually kind of funny. It's an account by uh, Nearchus of Crete, the admiral to the Alexander the Great. And uh, what he did, I mean, on the way back uh, from India, uh, their fleet got into trouble from what we know today. Uh, is It has all the... It fits the bill uh, to, to be a tsunami. It was in the kind of an earthquake. There was, it was not a storm, it was not a swell, and it seems to have been a tsunami. And they traveled about uh, 12,500 stadia, uh, which is sort of a measurement unit in back uh, in ancient Greece. And if you convert it uh, to today's uh, uh, geography, it'll sort of falls out around here. It's not way, uh, they were assuming it was in Macron, but it's not. And people have argued that it was probably up here, uh, you know, very close to Euphrates, but it wasn't really. I mean, if you follow the uh, the navigation map of the, uh, if you tally it, it just falls around here. Another example is an intriguing report by Wilkinson in 1964. I mean, it's just in his style, he's just waking up and says there was a tide wave a few years ago at Ras al Khaimah, which is here, this, uh, um, sort of a yellow star here, again, right here. Now, so there have been precedences, but can we actually model these things? Well, in order to model this, again, I can calculate the static deformation, the co-seismic deformation that I showed you before from, uh, from a point source, from a double couple, uh, from each of the blocks that I showed you. So I have three blocks, six scenarios. And from each of these scenarios, I can go ahead and use my tsunami simulation models to, cal to calculate the propagation of tsunamis around. And lo and behold, there is some stuff going on here in the Persian Gulf. Can we actually quantify this? Well, to quantify this, it's, uh, uh, it's actually kind of interesting. I put, uh, well, virtual gauges in my simulations all around the Persian Gulf here. And uh, with a bit of luck, I'm going to turn this around. And uh, basically what I'm showing you here is this map on its side. Uh, these are tight gauges on the horizontal axis and the vertical axis that have amplitude, but this, these, are, these start from here in the Northern side of the Gulf. And I'm just moving around and just coming back on the right side, on the East side. So here, this uh, sort of a black line is the Nadir of, uh, of the Persian Gulf. This is just sort of the major axis of the bathtub, basically, that I showed you before. So <clears throat> here is what I get. And again, you notice that pretty much all of the ruptures produce very, very similar tsunami amplitudes along the coastline. It doesn't really matter what kind of a model you use. You have pretty much the same amount of tsunami amplitudes, even from magnitude 9. You don't really get 
crazy amplitudes. But the fun part, and this is the nonlinear aspect of, the, of it all uh, that we hope to learn something from, is that uh, they all follow the same pattern. Now, if you look closely again, is that here, if I plot tsunami amplitudes in all of these tight gauges as a function of distance from the Strait of Hormuz, here is what I get. And this is um, uh, in a logarithmic scale. And I'm showing that you know, the tight gauges in the north uh, in red and the ones in the south uh, um, in blue. And these tight gauges are all virtual, uh, uh, if you wish. And the funny thing is that uh, the fit to all of this is one over a square uh, root of distance. And if you uh, have a, if you just recall from uh, uh, seismology 101, is that this is point source. When you have a point source on a, uh, on a, on a surface, in, in a, let's say in a uh, cylindrical uh, coordinate system, you have the energy, sort of the amplitude, decays as a function of uh, one over the square root of distance. And this is interesting because obviously I don't have a point source. What I do have is a finite rupture with, let's say, I mean, 400, 500 kilometers of length, but this is all I get. And well, to go crazy, I just put a uh, point source here and this, at the Strait of Hormuz. And this is a uh, sort of a scaled down, crude scaled down version of, of the main source using uh, uh, simple geometrical spreading and attenuation functions from the, from the tsunami. I just take that and put it here. And this is basically a cylinder uh, like this. I'm just putting uh, this cylinder and the entrance of the Strait of Hormuz and calculate uh, the tsunami. Now, remember this is not a new idea. This is uh, an idea put forth, I mean, attributed mostly uh, to Huygens. Uh, and the Huygens principle tells you that in, in, in optics, when you have a uh, propagation front, uh, each of the points in the propagation front acts as a uh, new uh, point source for the rest of the propagation. And uh, again, I'm just putting this one little point source here uh, as, uh, as a part of the propagation front and calculate the tsunami simulation throughout the uh, Persian Gulf using the exact same um, source. And here is what I get, and it's quite interesting. I'm showing the, uh, I'm just superimposing the tsunami, uh, maximum tsunami amplitudes along the coastline uh, over what I had from the rupture. And it's a beautiful match. And it tells me that uh, uh, it's just a point source. I'm just looking at the propagation front uh, from a point source that I have just artificially put at the entrance of the Gulf. Uh, it's like all of the all of the information from the source is just getting reset at, at, upon entrance. Uh, the size and magnitude of the earthquake don't matter. Now, just one more piece to this puzzle is that what about the source? Well, this is pretty much again, like I said, I'm just keep coming back to this bathtub analogy. I have a shallow uh, bathymetry here in the north, and I have a deeper bathymetry. I'm just putting like a point source here uh, for simplicity, but it all turns into a point source at here at any rate. But uh, simple frequency domain analysis tells me tells me that this bathtub would also ring. It, ha it will have its dominant frequencies in, in terms of uh, the response to the, to the propagating signal inside of it. And this is well studied and you can show that the dominant frequencies are given by this simple equation. Again, the screw of GHG is uh, this, uh, the speed of tsunami uh, in the Gulf. And then M and N are just integers. I can, uh, you know, just sort of a mode number and A and B are the dimensions of, uh, of the rectangular uh, propagation basin. And again, this is an elongated version of that when you can just obviously simplify the, the above equation into uh, this. And this plot here in the right is just sort of giving you the dominant frequencies, both in uh, sort of hertz and uh, in hours as a function of different val the values of M and M. Now I can plug in numbers for uh, from the Persian Gulf. A is about seven degrees, B is about you know two degrees. I convert this to SI units. And then with the average depth for the Persian Gulf about 35 meters, uh, I can calculate the dominant frequencies. Here on the right, I'm showing the spectra from my simulations, tsunami simulations in the Gulf. And then again, lo and behold, these two uh, correspond to uh, the dominant frequencies, the first two modes of oscillation of the Gulf. So in other words, uh, the Persian Gulf is not immune to the, uh, to the, to the, to the deep water tsunamis. It's also, uh, well, let's say it's not uh, going to be a catastrophe inside the Gulf, 
But it seems that the physical aspect of the problem that's presenting here is a nonlinear propagation of the tsunami front. It's just going to be a replacement of the propagation front, a point source. And that point source is going to resonate in the, in the Gulf using this very simple analogy. Now, again, just one, if you wish, one last nail in the coffin. This is uh, the propagation uh, pattern. And we were looking for uh, the, you know, what's, go, what's going to go on here as a result of this deformation at the bottom. Uh, I have a fast propagating wave that goes into a slow bathymetry. And it turns out that you know, Walter Munch and John Miles back in the 60s had shown that the fundamental modes of propagation in the Gulf only and only are going to depend uh, upon the size of entrance um, uh, of the slit, if you wish, and uh, the you know, sort of the minor axis of propagation, which is sort of parallel to the entrance. And this is sort of an, an agreement with what we've shown, and that's uh, uh, it's not going to be the, the source. It's not going to be the, the propagation. It's not going to be the source. It's just the geometry. It's what you get. It's something that you have very well cut for cut out for yourself that you can prepare against. It's not. It doesn't have the uncertainty uh, for the future in terms of like okay, the length of you know the, the width of the rupture. Ooh, and uh, uh, you know again, the takeaway is that the deep ocean tsunamis can indeed leak into the Gulf through the narrow straits. And again, the Huygen principle. Uh, can do magic in this particular case. Um, and I think I'll stop here. Um, thank you. A lot for everyone. Thank you. Um, are there any questions for Dr. Solari? Luciana asked, he says, I enjoyed it very much. In the chat. I'm glad. I'm glad uh, they liked it. Um, I had a question about the uh, so once it's propagated into like a gulf and there's um, and it's resonating, like how long would that last, or how long would that be a danger, I mm -hmm. guess, or a hazard? Right. Right. <clears throat> well, it's a. Uh, uh, it all really depends on um, the Q factor. I mean, this is again something that you know, we are all familiar in seismology with. Um, it's uh, basically for how long you can have a, uh, a wave propagating into, into, into something and it's still being there in spite of all the attenuation and all of that. And uh, it turns out, I mean, we've ran simulations for about 48 hours. And 48 hours for numerical simulation is sort of a canon because there are papers out there that show that. You know, for the majority of simulation models, after 48 hours, the simulations will start to diverge from the real world. So we've shown that in the 48 hours, there are still you know, things going up and down uh, here and there. Uh, but again, it all depends on how narrow or how wide your opening is with respect to uh, the dimensions of, uh, um, uh, of uh, again, uh, in your bathtub. And uh, this is something that, um, it will be great to look into uh, if you uh, figure out a way how to extend your simulations uh, into you know, further and further times in the future. But so far, it's uh, this little um, derivation seems to work. Thank you. Uh, James uh, Condor, you had a question? Yes. Uh, great talk, Amir. Thank you very much for that. Um, I am wondering about your energy in the back arc for both your Mexico and Japan examples. Am I to take it that you start with, uh, in your models, there's actually deformation in the seafloor in the back arc, or is there something else going on? Right. So um, it's actually the uh, co-seismic deformation. If the earthquake uh, is large enough, and if it's close enough, your landmass, or let's say close enough to the, to the back arc basin, the co-seismic deformation, what you calculate directly from the rupture here uh, that I'm showing here with an inclined line, can actually leak through the back arc. So if you go back to this little slide that I showed, these are actually co-seismic deformations that I calculated from uh, that static, if you wish, co-seismic deformation field. This is just, uh, this is not tsunami. This is the leakage of the formation in the back arc that contributes to, um, uh, uh, to, uh, to the tsunami. You can actually, it's an interesting thing, you can consider a bunch of other things. Uh, let me see if I can pull it up here. Oops. 
um, you can actually show there are other things contributing to all of this. And for example, surface waves uh, can also contribute because what you have in surface waves is you have a, you have a source and the energy from the from that source is going to propagate in all directions, and it's not minimal in terms of uh, mega thrust earthquakes. For example, in the case of Tohoku, if you, I put a source here uh, near Honshu, and I propagate the surface waves using the you know normal mode analysis, and this is why you're going to see some funny things going on here in this movie. You can actually see the entire uh, region is sort of getting deformed. Uh, like a you know you know uh, sort of swinging blanket, the entire Japanese islands are going to deform, and this is also we've shown that this is also a factor that's uh, uh, going to contribute to the back arc tsunamis. I hope I answered your question. Yes, yes, that's uh, fascinating. So in this way, that the surface waves um, that we were just seeing are causing some deformation on the seafloor, and then you're amplifying it because of the coastline shape. Is that the right way to think about that? Um, I so so this this little cartoon here is just basically this is just a surface. I've superimposed land on this artificially. So, sure. and and this is just the surface waves, and I'm not changing anything else. Okay. Uh, this doesn't really deal with tsunamis, but then uh, the change of the coastlines, the change of the patterns of the coastlines, uh, can also actually contribute to all of this because you have a sort of a problem. Uh, in which the boundary conditions are also changing, if you see what I mean. Uh, yeah. And that also contributes to something interesting, which is a, again, uh, this is another aspect of all of this. You can show that the horizontal component, horizontal displacement of this whole thing um, actually also contributes to the propagation of tsunamis. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Marguerite. Jadamek, would you like to, you probably know the area better if you want to talk about. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, can you can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I, I typed it. Anyway, I apologize, I came a couple minutes late, I had a previous thing, but at any rate, can you comment on like the, um, you know, how this may shed light on the, the Latoya Bay tsunami in Alaska? Like I wouldn't consider that a back arc one, but it appears to have been affected by the geography. Does this shed any light on, on those kinds of events? Oh. We haven't tested the Latuya Bay yet. Um, I mean, that's an interesting question, but the thing that made Latuya Bay uh, famous was its uh, monstrous ampl amplitude, tsunami amplitudes on the coast. It was just more, more of like a splash of tsunamis, like reaching like, you know, several hundreds of meters. And um, I'm not sure, and by, by the, and this is in a sort of a positive sense, I'm not sure, we haven't looked into it yet, but uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, just knowing the fact that uh, um, th these things cannot really produce like 500 meters of tsunami, you know, tsunami uh, runoffs uh, or creep or a splash uh, uh, up on the hills. Um, these are usually second order factors uh, that could, I mean, granted, could have nonlinear uh, manifestations uh, depending on the, on the topography. But, but yeah, but that's, a, that's an interesting uh, avenue to pursue. Did, did I answer your question? Yeah, that, yeah, that was it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Camilla Penny, you had a question? Hi. Yeah, can you hear me right here? Um, thank you. That was a really great talk. That was super interesting. Um, I was just wondering, in your models of the Macran, you only use sources that are kind of in the Pakistani, so the eastern side of the subduction zone. Um, and obviously, there's potential for there to be one generated by movement in the west. But is the implication of finding that it's all effectively looks like a point source from the Persian Gulf, that that wouldn't have any impact on the wave heights you'd expect to see in the Persian Gulf? Or do you think that if you were actually closer in terms of your source, that that might change the result? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I didn't really get to touch on that. But uh, well, as I mentioned before, I mean, the Macron is a sort of a tectonic mess. You have all kinds of stuff going on here in the Pakistani side, but in the Iranian side, it's actually more quiet. You, every once in a while, you get magnitude fives. And those are, I mean, quote unquote, deep. You get, you know, earthquakes at 40, 50 kilometers, sort of at the base of the you know, uh, seismogenic zone. Uh, but he, you're right here in the West, uh, block A, and presumably something in the, you know, further in the West, you can call it block D. These things are not you know as likely to produce something but this is again you know if plate tectonic has thought us anything over the past you know 70 years or 60 years is that anything is 
and you know and any kind of rupture extension or rupture, rupture contraction is sort of possible so you can get in principle ruptures at different places but uh, so that's one side of the puzzle the other side is that well uh, we have used sources at different distances from the rupture uh, so let me just go forward with a, you know sort of a simple analogy that I had here oh, there we go uh, actually hold on just one so have, we've played around with different positions of the source. And uh, this is interesting because it shows me that it, the, F, the effect of the positioning of the source on the rupture, uh, on, I'm sorry, on the propagation of tsunamis in, the, in sort of the uh, kind of the Gulf is minimal. Uh, it's still there. You can see that the further you put the source because uh, geometrical spreading dictates that the further you move from the source, the smaller the tsunami has to become. And then that sort of a point source that you put at the Strait of Hormuz also has to become smaller. But the effect doesn't really seem to be significant. In other words, for example, if, if you uh, look at, oh, oops, if you look at this plot here, you can actually see from different models, A, B, C, and D, and these are at different distances from the rupture, the difference at the uh, sites that we have put here is minimal. You don't really have that much of a difference. So even though it's in principle, it does matter. It seems that upon entering uh, uh, you know, the, the Gulf through the narrow strait, narrow opening, the old, most of the information, I would say the majority of the information from the, uh, from the faulting is going to be reset. I hope I, I answered your question. Yeah, that's great, thank you. Thank you very much. Are there other questions for Dr. Solari? Well, I'm just going to ask a quick one while you're on this slide. I assume the slight variation in amplitude just has to do with the coastline being not a perfectly round bathtub. Yeah. Okay. Well, there, there's there, there, yes and no. And yes is that you're absolutely right because the coastlines are, uh, are producing weird things. For example, here, uh, there's this, uh, the city yeah. of that year which produced, uh, you know, where we had a sort of a meteor tsunami, if you wish, in 2017. And well, the question was that, well, why only at that year? Well, no, nowhere else. And the, the, if you go back here in this slide, here, and that year is here, you see it's sort of a favorite position of the incoming waves, at, at either way you move. And uh, again, which is exactly why you have uh, different patterns of propagation in the south and in the north. Uh, in the north, the coastline is more regular. In the south, it's sort of wiggly and it's really jagged. So you get all kinds of uh, geomorphic uh, expressions. So yeah, that's that's a significant factor. Okay. Thank you. Um, other questions? Oh, Anne Van Horn, would you like to ask your question? Oh, and I'll ask it. There we go. Uh, sorry. Uh, can you tell us uh, about the software you're using? For example, when you move the point source around uh, Oaxaca and show the propagation in the Gulf, um, the information that you've conveyed is so well illustrated. So just what are you using, I guess, to show us this? Right. Uh, so <clears throat> they, uh, I think it's a twofold question. One is how I, you know, um, um, how I made the movies, I guess, or, or how I just did the simulations. The simulations is, uh, I did them, but uh, a, a sort of a community code, uh, code is called uh, Most, and it's maintained and developed by NOAA, and they are routinely using it for all kinds of sources all around the Pacific and elsewhere in the world. So um, it is a non-hydrostatic code, uh, if that's what, what they're asking. About the movies, it's just uh, the question of, uh, you know, uh, putting things around and illustrating the simulations. You can use any kind of software uh, that's, that, that, that you want. I think, um, yeah, I, I hope I answered the question. Yes, she does. So. OK. All right. Um, are there other questions from anyone? If not, we can thank Dr. Amir Solari again for the interesting talk. I'll applaud for everyone. Thank you very much.